Hello, we are Gregor and Bernhard from Dreinschlag Vienna. Today we want to talk about using sharp swords in longsword training. Yeah, we started using sharp sword in our training a while back because we were unsatisfied with our understanding of some of the well um, key concepts and some techniques. And we thought in order to you know, take it to the next level, we had to use sharp swords. We had to make it realistic. But it turns out realism is a tricky concept, so let's talk about that first. At first, I guess, we were a bit naive about this whole concept of realistic longsword fencing. But we quickly came to the conclusion that realism is always something relative, something contextual. If, for example, you use Joachim Maya as your main source, it would be very realistic for you to use a feeder simulator to, to wear flashy trousers and, of course, to sport a fancy beard. Our sources, however, are mainly early to mid-1500s, uh, fencing manuals in the Lichtenauer tradition, such as Peter von Danzig, Judelöw or Teilhofer. And we know that in that time, longsword fencing still was very much intended to be used in actual duels, as in trial by combat. And we also know that <clears throat> many of these trials were bloody, gory affairs. So it doesn't really come as a surprise then that many text passages and pictures in the manuals make it abundantly clear that these techniques really were meant to hurt incapacitate or kill the opponent. So I guess if we were serious about getting realistic, we would, we would actually have to get ready to kill or get killed, doing so in 15th century clothes, including shoes with leather soles. We would not be training or for that matter fighting in a gym on synthetic flooring, but of course on earth or grass or cobblestones. And that's only the cultural and material side. Let's Try and factor in psychology and emotion as well. Imagine, for example, somebody pulling a knife on you with evil intent. That obviously would be very stressful, very bad, right? But now in this mental picture, try to replace this knife with 120 centimeters of sharpened steel. That's outright terrifying, right? And you'd be there in this duel, in this trial, full well knowing it's either going to be you or them who'll walk away from there. And we can take this actually further, because I think there's a socio-economic dimension to this as well. Let's say, for example, in this duel, in this trial situation, you could say, no, nah, I'm not putting my life on the line here, it's just too dangerous, I'll just concede defeat. You could do that, but imagine in nowadays, in modern terms, losing a big lawsuit. You'd have to bear all costs and compensations. And uh, that's not all, because in a society where things such as personal integrity, personal honor, are still very extremely important in, in daily dealings, you'd have to bear a huge load of shame and humiliation as well. And let's face it, even if you did win, you might get hurt in the process, and you might even die from your wounds later. So realism in training for us would imply period clothing, sharp blades, and a very real terror of lasting physical and social consequences. In conclusion, I think it's safe to say that we cannot achieve realism, and more importantly, we really don't want to. So what can we do then? Well, we can try to change some variables. For example, we could wear 15th century outfits, but we know from many years of experience with period clothing that men's clothing isn't heavy and doesn't hinder free movement, so there's really not much here to influence the actual fencing. And we have experimented with wearing period shoes as well, but it really just doesn't make sense using them on, on the modern gym floor. And while training with bladed weapons outdoors on grass or earth sounds like a good idea, it's really dependent again on weather and light conditions and of course the goodwill of the resident police and the neighbors. So no period clothing for regular training for us. That's why we zeroed in on sharp swords as our main variable. But as we started to experiment, we quickly learned that, well, there's sharp and then there's real sharp. Let me show you what I mean. We did a little test here on a piece of pork meat with the skin still attached. I know this is a rather crude test and this isn't really about the effectiveness of a cut, but it serves only to demonstrate the difference between two levels of sharpness. In this first video, Gregor is using a hand-forged longsword he had sharpened by a professional, and he's consciously using very little force here to simulate something like a quick situational draw cut or push cut along, for example, the neck area or the back of the hand. 
And you can see this really does a lot of damage. It goes cleanly through skin and fat and it bites deeply into muscle as well. Let's compare this with a sharp blade. We sharpened ourselves with a grindstone. Make no mistake, this is still sharp enough to catch on a fingernail, but when Gregor draws it across with about the same force, you can see the cut hardly breaks the skin. This is the level of sharp we use for training now. In our experience, the blades still very much behave like very sharp swords in a bind, but, well, the danger of accidentally hurting a training partner is at least somewhat reduced. In a similar vein, we decided to leave the tips of our training swords blunt. Again, as you can see, this actually does make a difference. I mean, you need to be careful, of course, because it would still be very easy to skewer your partner with this blunt tip on a sharp blade with enough force. This is really only intended as something like a last-ditch safety measure for when, for example, one partner misjudges their distance for those two fingers breath or they take that unexpected half step in. Speaking of safety, we started out wearing full modern HEMA protection like this, but this left us somewhat dissatisfied because we just didn't feel that threatened by the naked blade. And more importantly, we saw this leads to reckless maneuvers and, and more re disregard for safety. Plus, we feel that all that safety gear sort of tends to mess with proprioception and your feeling for distance. Let me show you what I mean. Masks, gloves and HEMA jackets of course do a great job at keeping your face, your hands and body out of harm's way. But as you can see, this can lead in some situations to perceived hits where there actually are none. So for us, this means no mask, no thick gloves, no HEMA jacket. In a word, less safety, but maybe a somewhat better perception of what's going on around us. Now you need to understand that this is by no means a recommendation. It's simply what we did. And if you say that's royally stupid because it's really dangerous, you are probably right. But you see, there's the rub. This feeling of danger is exactly what keeps us very focused and alert. It also means we took it really slowly from the start. I should maybe also say at this point that we've been fencing buddies for over 10 years. We are about the same size, we have similar reach and mass, and we communicate very clearly exactly what we expect each other to do or not to do in a given exercise context. I guess the point here is just don't trust somebody you've not trained with extensively with something as precious as your health and indeed your life. However, since we wants to expand our training to controlled free sparring with sharp swords, we want some measure of passive protection in our bodies that doesn't actually feel like wearing safety equipment and doesn't give a false sense of security, like for example a fencing mask. Again, one option is to wear period clothing. We know that wool over linen is actually very resilient against cuts and uh, for this test we actually used the very sharp blade, uh, blade and you can see this really does pretty little damage. Actually, linen alone is very tough too. We also know from experience that cutting a soaked tatami roll that has been wrapped with one layer of linen and one layer of wool is surprisingly tough to cut into. Incidentally, that is one of the many things we learned along the way. There's probably a reason why our fencing manuals seem to focus strikes and cuts so much on the head and neck area and the hands and wrists, basically areas that are not or are at least not fully protected by clothing. However, transporting and carrying and uh, getting in and out of period clothing proved simply impractical. Plus, we wanted to get some protection, especially for the neck and the hands. So, this is what we ex are experimenting with right now. We have here a shirt made from Slash Pro, which is a special cut resistance fabric, a balaclava made from the same fabric, Slash Pro a pair of leather gloves and simple eye protection. And we combine these as needed. Our simple tests indicate that Slash Pro actually does a good job at keeping us from getting cut accidentally. This is me basically sawing away at the shirt, again with a very sharp blade. And um, well, maybe it's a bit hard to see, but um, the fabric is partly torn, but not actually cut through. So it does seem to be pretty tough. But again, let me say this very clearly, none of that will save you or us for that matter, from a full force strike, a cut, let alone thrust. This is really only intended for when the unexpected happens and someone slips or stumbles or underestimates the reach. And again, I need to stress, this is not a recommendation, just a report on what we've been up to.
So what are some of our takeaway points so far? Well, one of the first things we discovered was a newfound respect for the blade. You automatically treat a sharp blade different than you would treat a blunt or a feeder. You are, for example, very careful where you point it. You don't just leave it lying around. You don't lean on it or fiddle with it while talking. But there's something much more important, actually. Something every fencer knows in their head becomes extremely clear on a visceral level when there is really someone swinging a potentially deadly weapon at you. You simply don't want to get hit. So you automatically move your body around more, torso and feet, and uh, you really try to control the center line to keep it blocked with your blade. And um, I suppose we can also say that at least for us, training with sharp swords has definitely led to far less double hits in sparring with blunt swords or feather simulators. Another big thing is how the blade behaves in a bind. As you probably know, working from a bind, Winden, is one of the key concepts of the German school of longsword fencing. But why? For us, the answer is now very clear, because you are afraid of that blade. You simply want to know, want to feel where it is. You want to be able to control it. Which brings us to another point, Fühlen. This is another central concept of the German school of fencing. In the very moment your blades touch, you are supposed not to see, but to feel quite literally whether the opponent is weak or strong and proceed accordingly. This is something where the difference between blunt simulators and sharp blades becomes extremely pronounced in our opinion. Let's take a closer look at what happens when two sharp blades collide. Let's, uh, let's suppose you want to do a Fazetzen, basically an active parry of your opponent's strike. You could catch their blade with your flat, but this means their blade will glide on yours, and with polished and well-maintained blades, this might happen very abruptly, which also means you won't have much control of it. Unless you specifically want that to happen, it's generally a bad idea in our experiences. But you could do that, for example, to uh, in order to get closer for wrestling. Here's a slow-mo example to give you an idea. On the other hand, if you catch their blade with your edge, something like this will likely happen. The narrow edges will cause a lot of friction in a very small area and often the edges will also bite into each other. That's what you actually can see in these pictures I took with the USB field microscope. This is then what makes it possible to manipulate, manipulate the other blade and uh, here's actually a short video to illustrate this. As you can see, Gregor's control of my blade is really very secure, at least for a moment. Let's try this with a common training tool, the feeder. As you can see, regardless of edge or flat, the simulators tend to glide all over the place. It really takes a lot of force to secure a bind. This, in our experience, often leads to exaggerated and sometimes jumpy motion, sort of telegraphed actions. So in conclusion, with sharp swords catching and securing the blade with the edge, then testing for a reaction quickly becomes a sort of second nature. And so Winden and counter Winden starts to occur naturally. For us, this also means that in order to really understand the concepts of Fühlen and Winden, it is actually necessary to experiment with sharp blades at some point. So uh, let's address the elephant in the room. Will catching the blade with the edge not hurt your blade? Of course it will. But guess what? Swords are tools, and if you use a tool frequently, you might have to take it in for maintenance at some point. Or if that's not going to be possible, or going, if, if it's not possible to repair the tool, you'll have to replace it eventually. Besides, the amount of wear you get on your blade also really depends on the quality of steel and craftsmanship and, of course, on the things you put your blade through. So how do we go about incorporating sharp blades into our training? Well, firstly, very, very carefully. We've actually had training sessions where we opted to stay away from the shops simply because one of us had a long day at work, a headache or just one too many espressos. Other than that, we basically do most kinds of single and partner drills we do with blunts as well. But since we don't use sharps all the time, we mostly end up focusing on specific techniques we want to review.
after having established in what way using sharp blades might be important for this specific technique, we practice it it's in a controlled manner. And uh, for more speed, and especially for everything involving thrusts and body contact, we will change to blunts or fader simulators for repeated partner drills. So essentially, we keep switching between sharp and blunts depending on what we need. We also started to do free sparring with sharp swords. These clips are actually from when we tried out the Slash Pro outfits for the first time, so we're, we were a bit nervous, I suppose. Before that, we did some very controlled free play without protection gear. And what we feel very clearly is simply being threatened with a sharp sword outside of a regulated drill will do wonders for your most heartfelt desire to keep that blade away from you or to keep it under control. You will not be much tempted to do something flashy or, or daring. After flow sparring, we like to take turns starting with a strike to get into a bind, then stay in Winden until one of us is maneuvered into an awkward position or we simply get bored. We try to keep the pace steady and um, to get into a flow of offense and defense. And for thrusts, we mostly only orient the, the blade and move it just a tiny bit towards the opponent, indicating a window for a thrust. So for us, this really is active loading. There are no points, no rounds. And we take mental notes, notes about distance and windows of opportunity and how we were able to exploit those. And often we will stop and talk about a specific situation and try to recreate it with different outcomes. What we noted right away was how much slower this kind of sparring was. This isn't only because we were extra careful to keep control of our plate, but maybe even more so because we were we felt very anxious to keep control over the other blade as well. And um, I think this very real need for self-preservation also helped us with some techniques which we are convinced rely on the opponent to sort of bodily recoil from a sudden change of speed and force and therefore lock up. Uh, Fakere comes to mind here as well as Fehler or, or Oben Abnehmen. And going back to Fehler sparring, it's, it's actually hard to imagine this kind of speed with sharp blades. Simply because the faster you move, the smaller your time window for reaction becomes. And that means less control. And as I've, I think I've established by now, we really don't want that to happen. And these days, we actually tend to think that this flow sparring speed is maybe pretty close to a realistic fencing speed, provided both fighters are sane and not suicidal. That also means that maybe most modern HEMA long Ward sparring, which is what we used to do for a long time too, might in fact be way too speedy. That and the high level of protection and therefore lack of concern for getting hit might also be a cause of um, the generally high number of double hits in, in many bouts out there. Again, you need to understand that we don't actually recommend using sharp swords for free sparring. It's inherently dangerous and probably actually a bad idea. Still, we believe there's a lot to be gained for us in terms of experience. So I guess we're just going to keep experimenting. So in conclusion, training with sharp swords isn't essentially realistic, but I can say that for us it's proven to be a, a reasonable compromise. We, we really believe incorporating sharp blades into longsword training will prove extremely insightful for all longsword fences out there. And we can say for us at least, we've really learned a lot and we're still learning. However, in our opinion, this is something for the experienced Himaist. You simply don't want someone who hasn't internalized basic movements and techniques yet running around with a sharp sword, right? And um, if you do partner drills, start very, very slowly. Uh, be careful in picking your tools and protective gear and most of all, your training partner. Okay, that's it folks. Have fun training and stay safe.